Um, I'm the only field pathologist uh, that, that works for uh, the state of Maine uh, forest pathologist. So um, uh, I tend to travel travel around quite a bit and uh, have a lot of things to keep track of. But uh, beech leaf disease is one of those uh, newer things that I've uh, been tasked with, and it's uh, been quite interesting. But so my job with the uh, state of Maine is to provide technical assistance to anybody, um, whether we're talking about a large timber company uh, to a homeowner. Again, I have statewide responsibility. I, pro I provide training on tree health and pathology related issues. So I do, I'll do a walk and talk, uh, maybe with one of our foresters or uh, you know, other types of events. Uh, I do a lot of sort of content development, things like websites, I write fact sheets, uh, write uh, um, grants on occasion. Um, also, I do presentations uh, for groups like this. Um, I'm often called to advise on uh, issues of forest pathology that are uh, of concern to the state or the region. Um, and I also do a lot of survey work for various uh, forest pathogens of concern. So that's kind of um, an overview of my position with the state, but we're here to talk about beech leaf disease and management. So we'll get started with that. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So what is beech leaf disease? Uh, it's an invasive disease that's pretty new to North America. It affects uh, all beech trees, including all cultivars. Um, all over the world, as far as we know, which is kind of an interesting uh, aspect of this disease. You know, usually we have uh, uh, diseases that uh, only affect trees in, in one area where, you know, the, the pathogen and, and the host didn't co-evolve. In this sense, uh, in this situation, uh, pretty much everything suffers at least some symptoms uh, from this disease complex. And I'm going to elaborate on what that uh, disease complex is or means in just a little bit. Um, but beech leaf disease, no surprise, affects leaves and it, uh, it really changes the leaf's uh, function, uh, how it uses water and its photosynthetic capacity. Um, as it, you know, the root, as it, it's, it's a, it's a long-term kind of, kind of a chronic stressor. And as, uh, as time, um, as time goes forward, with an infected infected tree, uh, the trees eventually uh, die um, due to just a, a lack of resources. Um, in larger trees, so, so there's most of the most of the mortality happens in the the understory at least first. Um, um, they say that in, in places that have had beech leaf disease for a longer time, they say that eventually it moves up into the the overstory and uh, will kill uh, mature beech. And I'll talk about this in a, bit, a little bit in, in a little more detail. But ma major uh, message here is that this is a chronic uh, stressor uh, to all beech trees. And uh, there are some pretty clear symptoms and signs that we'll, that we'll go over. So what causes beech leaf disease? Unfortunately, that's still not 100% clear. And there's a lot of work that's being done on this, but researchers have uh, Pretty much, uh, they all agree that a nematode um, that we call LCN, which stands for Lytolinchus cronatse mechanii, which is kind of a mouthful, so we just say LCN. But um, this uh, nematode uh, is uh, native to Japan, or let's say there's a very similar species uh, that's native to Japan. The species that, that's causing the, the, the disease here in the United States is a subspecies uh, called mechanii. Um, there are also, my hunch is that there's some other microorganisms that are involved, bacteria, maybe a virus, maybe fungi, um, maybe also in combination with some environmental factors. Uh, so it's, it's unclear, there's a lot of work being done on it uh, to try to you know, clarify exactly what's happening, but the, the nematode is, is a uh, very important part of this story. So what is a plant parasitic nematode? It's a really unusual pathosystem or, um, you know, like disease of above ground woody plants. There's a lot of nematodes that um, attack uh, herbaceous uh, and annual plants. Uh, there's several species that attack uh, root systems. 
um, in both crops and some in trees as well. But a foliar nematode is a pretty unique, uh, a pretty unique pathogen as, as far as trees are concerned. So the reason we know that this is a plant parasitic nematode, okay, I do have my arrow there. So you can see there's a little uh, straight line at the head of the nematode at the top of the screen. I hope you both can see that. So that uh, what that arrow is pointing to, is, it's, a, it's called a stylet. And it's basically a little hypodermic needle that the nematode pushes out and pushes into a cell and just sucks cell contents out of the cell. That's how they feed. So these are very, very small creatures, uh, 0.8 millimeters in size, weighing a, a whopping 1.2 or 0.12 micrograms. Uh, you would think that these are very kind of weak, not really robust creatures, but the exact opposite is true. They have an incredible capacity to exist in either very alkaline uh, or um, high pH uh, situations, but also extremely low pH or very acidic uh, um, environments. So uh, they're, they're actually even able to completely dry out. So they've done some studies where they've dried them out in, uh, in an ovens at 90, de uh, 90 degrees for several hours and then taken them out, waited a couple hours, put a drop of water on them and they just start, they wake up and just start swimming around. Uh, the eggs are incredibly uh, incredibly durable as well. Some species of nematodes, in fact, uh, they've um, the, the eggs have stayed viable for as many as, I believe it's 40 years. So uh, nematodes, despite being these clear, incredibly small uh, roundworms, microscopic roundworms, they're, they're very, very tough, uh, very resilient uh, creatures. Um, yes, I think I covered everything on that slide. So how does beech leaf disease spread? That's another really good question that we don't fully know the answer to. But recent a recent study um, suggests that it's primarily rain and wind um, with a, a, the main migration period late in the summer, early fall. So uh, late August to October is when they found these are distributing via wind and rain. Excuse me. So, um, which are the most, excuse me, robust uh, life cycle of this, uh, this species are, the, um, they're the overwintering life form uh, as well as eggs in some cases, but um, they are the most robust and they're the ones that are being distributed late in the summer. There may be birds associated. There might be mites associated. Those mites might be hitch, hitching rides on birds. Um, so, you know, the, the, the nematode would be either in or on a mite uh, that is on a bird. Uh, the birds themselves could carry nematodes or nematode eggs. Um, there's even some theories that a bird could eat a caterpillar that's been eating a leaf containing the nematodes or the eggs. Um, and then when that the, the bird eats, eats the caterpillar, um, bird flies someplace else, excretes, uh, their, their waste and spreads the disease that way. Um, there's also some new evidence suggesting that woolly beech aphid uh, can carry uh, beech leaf disease, disease nematodes. And I don't know if any of you have seen those before, but they're, uh, they look like cotton stretched across a branch. And when you go disturb them, they all kind of ryth rhythmically bob, bob their heads um, as a kind of a defense uh, strategy or, or behavior. <laughs> But they they are they have found uh, nematodes kind of hitchhiking on those in at least a couple situations. So a little history about beech leaf disease. It was first found in Ohio in 2012, and by 2020, the distribution map looked like this. And at this point, I'm still not worried about beech leaf disease because it's so far away from Maine that uh, just I had other things to worry about. Well, in oops, oops. Up here. Yeah, so by 2021, though, it showed up in Maine, and the distribution map looked like this. So somehow, the beech leaf disease nematode was able to make it from uh, Connecticut and northern Mass uh, to all the way up to um, uh, Waldo County, Maine, which was a big surprise. 
Uh, yeah, so the pr closest previous known, lo known location was Massachusetts, and we were pretty quick, quickly able to confirm the disease in, in four counties. By 2022, there was some more uh, spread. We confirmed it in six counties in Maine. And as of last year, the end of 2023, we've now found it in 11 Maine counties, and there's, there's your list. Um, so I think I already covered this. This is from a, a meeting that I was on yesterday. So from 2023 or 2022 to 2023, those red counties are uh, the new counties that were reported. This was from a, a, a Northeast uh, Forest Health Update by the U.S. Forest Service. And this is data that we, us Northeastern states provide to, to provide, provide to the region for making maps like this. Aaron, there's a question. Um, I have to be able to see it. Um, I said, could it hitch rides on cars or tires? It was suggested it was at our lake property in 2021, and that next year it was quite extensive in our woods in a Rockport property down the road. So they, the properties are not adjacent. They're, mm -hmm. you know, there's two separate properties. That, you know, yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, anything's possible, I suppose, until until we figure out really the details. I would think that that would be a little bit less likely, um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I really don't know. Uh, I think my personal opinion is that this can spread in a lot of different ways. I think it can probably spread um, in leaf litter, uh, maybe, you know, removing mulch, for example, it just, mostly because eggs and, and juveniles are so good at dispersing. And they can persist in many different environmental uh, conditions. So back to the distribution. So speaking of distribution, this is this is the resource that that, that stake in Maine. Uh, the pink is based on forest inventory data. Uh, this is the birch resource. We have quite a lot of beech trees in the state, and uh, they of course have not only economic value but also very uh, high ecological value. Uh, this is a, a map of the current distribution in, in Maine. So uh, the towns are, are color coded uh, re regarding which year they were, they were confirmed. Uh, this is on our beach leaf, the Maine Forest Service beach leaf disease website that uh, we maintain, and I try to keep updated as well as I can. Um, on that website, you can find a lot of the, the most recent information about beach leaf disease. I try to keep it really current. Yesterday, I was on the National Research Beach uh, National National Beach Leaf uh, Disease Research uh, meeting, so I, I try to stay really current on this and uh, try to reflect what I know in, in that website. So here's some per perspective. Another unfortunate story: uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. This is. Uh, the extent that hemlock woolly adelgid spread in 70 years. So, you know, from northern Georgia up to, you know, our, our neck of the woods. Um, and beech leaf disease has pretty much mirrored that in just 11 years. Uh, of course, it doesn't range as far south uh, with, with the native range of beech. And there seems to be a north a northern spread to, to, to beech leaf disease. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, again, lots of theories and hypotheses, but we just don't have enough years worth of research to really um, say for sure. So another important part of this, this whole sto story is another unfortunate disease for, for beach called beach bark disease. And this is something that we've had in, in Maine for a very long time. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, the tree that's pictured in this uh, this, this slide is, is one that's resistant to uh, beech bark disease. Um, I don't have a lot of healthy uh, tree uh, photos of, of healthy trees and leaves because I'm a pathologist, so I tend to focus on different stuff. But um, this is, I thought it would be you know, nice to just remind people what a beech tree can look like that's, uh, that's healthy. Um, but the beech bark disease system is the combination of a beech scale that's non-native non and one of our native or one or two of our native uh, neonectria fungi. So it's a little bit of a different, different story. It's the scale that's non-native and the fungus that's native. And those, uh, the scale predisposes the, the beech tree to beech bark disease. So we've got the non-native scale, which is 
seen here, and it's it's kind of woolly form. It's a little looks a little bit like hemlock woolly adelgid, and then we have the spore producing structures of the neo of a neonectria fungus, and together those create uh, the beech trees that look like this. You have numerous cankers, a lot of callus tissue that prevents water and nutrients from going uh, up up the tree uh, to the ground. Um, it's a chronic stressor, but our our beech tree are very resilient and they've somehow managed even in, in really heavy cankered situations they somehow managed to, to to stay alive they're not growing really, really well um, but they're 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 hanging in there um, these are the impacts of beach bark disease chronic stressor reduces ecological value that doesn't for the trees that are in, in, impacted don't produce as many uh, nuts as in hard, yeah, hard mass as uh, those that are uh, not um, this reduces, because the trees aren't growing, economic value is, is hindered. They say between about 1% and 5% of trees have some level of resistance. Um, the mechanism of a resistance is, is partially known, um, and I, I won't get into that today because that's, that's half a presentation worth of information. So um, the big question here, and the reason I mentioned this is, uh, are, are we going to find trees in our forest that are resistant to both beech bark disease and beech leaf disease? And this is a, this is what concerns me most. Um, and yeah, I don't want to get into the, again, the, the details of, of mechanism, the mechanisms of resistance for, for the associated with these diseases, but um, the chances of a, of a tree being resistant to two uh, non-native uh, tree pest is pretty small, so uh, it's definitely a concern to our beach resource. So let's talk about beach leaf disease symptoms. I'll try to go through this quickly because a lot of you, unfortunately, have probably seen these before. Um, again, here's a healthy American beach leaf, and I didn't have one in my collection, so I had to borrow one from the wild and adirondacks. Um, but anyway, uh, banding of leaves between the leaf veins is something that... Uh, uh, tells us beech leaf disease is present. So here's a, it's, it's best viewed when you're underneath the canopy and you're looking up into the canopy where you get that uh, silhouette type uh, um, effect. So uh, in the blue, in the blue circle here, you can see, you maybe you can't see because it's a very light uh, area of light infection. There's just a couple bands in that blue circle. Here we have moderate, you can probably see a couple leaves that have several bands on them. And then here's an area of the crown that has more heavy banding. And this is a symptom that's pretty hard to miss. If you're, if you're looking for it and you've seen it before, you can pick up on it pretty good at severe, or let's say moderate and a little bit more than moderate levels. Um, but when it's, a, when it's a, like in the blue circle, when it's traced, it's, it's pretty hard to, to see it. You gotta spend some time looking. So if you're concerned about uh, your your uh, your beach trees, go stand under them for some time or, or lay down on the forest floor and look up. And I say that because uh, the saplings and seedlings are the ones that are usually impacted first. So if you, you're likely to see symptoms in the understory before you see them in the, in the overstory. Um, so the physiological impacts of banding are lower carbon assimilation and uh, lower water water use efficiency, um, and uh, so these are the neg negative physiological impacts of uh, banded leaves. And and banded leaves have a moderate level of impact. The crinkled leaves, which I'll show you next, have a much greater impact uh, on these you know critical physiological functions. There's a difference in in banding. Uh, with seasons. So in the spring, it's it's a little bit harder to detect uh, as the leaves are just emerging. But you can tell if you look closely, there's definitely a, a difference between diseased leaves versus uh, clean leaves. In the fall, sometimes you get cl uh, chlorosis associated with the bands, but not always. Um, and uh, not exactly sure why this happens in, in some, some areas and not in others. It might have something to do with uh, soil nutrients and, and uh, iron availability or something like that. I really don't know for sure. Um, in the winter, you can also see symptoms, uh, banding symptoms of beech leaf disease. Um, and if you're a person who, you know, has a, a collection of trees of different cultivars, uh, the different cultivars 
present symptoms in pretty unique ways. So uh, definitely um, if you have, you know, like a European copper beach, like the, like the one uh, pictured here, the symptoms are a little bit different. So keep, uh, keep, keep a close eye on, on those as well. So here are some more winter beach leaf disease uh, symptoms. And this kind of segues into something that we're doing this winter. Uh, another thing you can look for in the winter for beach leaf disease is this kind of clustering of buds uh, that that, um, that branch branchlet tips. Uh, you can see the ones uh, on the left here. Uh, you have clustering of buds because the buds are aborted or killed by excessive nematode feeding in the bud during the winter. And so uh, when buds are killed, volunteer buds kind of ger uh, germinate and or emerge, let's say, uh, from from the wood, and you get this clustering type effect. Unlike the uh, the uninfected buds on, on the right. So this, I just wanted to segue into the uh, winter survey. So I'm I'm one person, and uh, I don't have a whole lot of I don't have as much technician time as I would like. Let's say, especially during the summer, because we're a very small shop. Uh, we don't have that many people uh, working in the office and uh, we have a lot of stuff to do in a very short amount of time in the summer. So I don't get as much time for survey in the summer as I'd like. So um, based on a, a recent scientific paper, we, we, we devised a, a winter bud survey where we can actually go out, collect buds in areas where beach leaf disease has, hasn't been reported. And we target areas that are close to water because uh, uh, Usually when beach leaf disease shows up in a new area, it's usually associate, associated with some kind of uh, water, whether that's a, a stream or a pond or, or a lake. So we, we collect, you know, about 15 buds per site, sometimes more. And we typically uh, collect those buds from the understory. We take them into the lab, we put them in water, we dissect them, we look at them under the microscope. Um, here on the left, we have uninfested buds, uh, bud scales from uh, a beech tree. And on the right, we have infested buds. And you can see the difference. There's kind of um, some disorganized cells in, in these areas, of course. Well, I'm, I'm pointing to them in the pointer on my, my screen, but you guys can't see that. So just where those blue arrows are pointing, uh, that uh, is a very clear indication of, of nematode feeding. And uh, when you look closer, I don't know, hopefully you folks can see those little nematodes uh, circled in yellow, very small in, in the bud. And the thought is that they, when they stick their stylet, that hypodermic needle uh, at, their, at their front end into a, into a cell, they not only suck things out, but they also push some molecules into the, into the cell that causes the cell metabolism to change. And that is supposed to be uh, improve the, the feeding status for the nematode during the winter. So um uh, that's kind of that disorganized and, and modeled uh, cellular structure that you can see uh, pointed to in the blue arrows. And uh, the, the state of Maine was kind enough to um, uh, pass some of the things, uh, pass a budget that included a microscope camera for me uh, this last uh, funding cycle. So we were able to get uh, some really nice uh, higher resolution pictures of a nematode. So this is this this is uh, this is the evil doer right here, um, and you can see the stylet, and you can even see the esophagus and all their their crazy anatomy. Um, and there's probably some eggs uh, down at the tail end, um, but that's that's what that's what these things look like. Luckily, this is not a life size. Mm -hmm. size uh, picture. Mm -hmm. But back to BLD symptoms. So uh, what causes the banding? I just kind of ex explained that effector or trigger uh, effector molecules or, or kind of molecular triggers that, that change cell structure and metabolism. It also causes the double, a doubling of leaf thickness. So a typical beech leaf is about seven cells wide. Uh, when when in, um, infected with a nematode, uh, Things happen cell, cell, cellularly, excuse me, and uh, the, the leaves are about 15 uh, cells wide or more. And that's what causes the, the leathery leaf or the, the crinkled leaf symptom, which I'm going to show you here in a second. But one thing to, I think, an important point to make here is that 
all of the damage that you see during the summer happens in the winter. So a, true, a, a leaf that emerges in the, in the summer and has two bands on it, it's only ever going to have two bands. It's not going to uh, develop 10 bands or it's not going to all of a sudden become leathery or crinkled. So all this damage happens in the winter. Uh, and that's uh, partially dependent upon nematode populations, how much feeding is happening. And probably some other things that, that I don't understand and haven't been uh, figured out yet. So distorted growth and leathery leaves, again, healthy leaf, but this is what they look like when they have really high nematode populations. So the leathery leaf on, on, the, on the right, um, if you were to take a leathery leaf in, let's say, August or September and slice it and put it into a petri dish with water, nematodes would just pour out of it, wriggling around. You know, have to have a, a pretty good microscope to see this, but uh, leathery leaves are heavily infested with large numbers of nematodes. And then those numbers kind of, the nematodes start to die uh, later in the, in the summer and, and into the early fall. And that's when those uh, juvenile females are at their, their uh, highest numbers. And that's when you have the larger dispersal events. Uh, so crinkling leaves have 53% lower ability to assimilate carb carbon that's taken energy from the sun and making sugars essentially. Um, and they have a 60% higher stomatal conductance, which means that they're pushing out a lot more water uh, when they are crinkled and 67% uh, lower water use efficiency. Um, so they're losing a lot more water than they're gaining in carbon. And this is a stress that leads to branch and crown dieback and sort of accelerates the mortality scenario. There are some lookalikes on the left. I've got Aranium galls uh, by, uh, made by Aerophyidmite. Again, one of these extremely small microscopic uh, creatures that injects some effector molecules into the leaf that causes some irregular growth. But you can see that there's kind of these velvety patches. It is intervenal, like between the veins, just like uh, banding. But uh, uh, when you look closely, it's not kind of a contiguous band. It's kind of belty patches. Then there's the woolly beach aphid uh, on the right, which causes the leaves to kind of curl and be a little bit chlorotic or yellow, but uh, doesn't cause banding. And you can see this like, uh, um, under the leaf uh, with woolly, woolly beach aphid, you can see some of the wool. It's kind of a wax that they produce on their bodies to uh, protect themselves. Beach anthracnose, uh, you can see the brown spots or lesions on the leaf. It's another one, you know, people send me this and say, hey, is this beach leaf disease? No, it's not. Um, it's just another one of those diseases that's everywhere in the forest, at least a little bit, and only gets bad on, on really wet uh, years. But uh, the main takeaway is to be sure your di diagnosis before uh, you think about treatment, for example. Um, this, is, this isn't something that I, I urge with all um, management efforts. Make sure you know what you're dealing with before you forge ahead with uh, treatment. So, uh, in terms of stand symptoms, usually, like I, I said earlier, the disease starts to get going in the understory and then um, moves up into the overstory. This is what um, the forest look like, looks like when uh, beach leaf disease is severe. You can, you know, otherwise, if this was a healthy beach forest, you wouldn't be able to, uh, these pictures would just be a wall of green, right? Because they have, beach trees have big leaves and uh, they're shade tolerant, so they kind of fill up the gaps in the, in the understory. Um, but when beech leaf disease is, uh, is severe, you have a, a lot of buds that die from feeding over the winter and don't emerge, you know, they don't uh, push out leaves. Um, and the, the trees are distressed, the leaves are smaller, these are deformed, and you get these kind of views, unfortunately. I've already mentioned this stuff. Um, this is what we call ground zero. This is the first place that beach leaf disease was uh, re reported in, in Maine, uh, in Lincolnville. And uh, uh, the, the people who reported it were, were kind enough to let me take some time-lapse uh, photos. 
Um, and um, they've also been kind enough to let, let us set up a long-term monitoring plot on their land, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But this is what things looked like in May 29 of 2021. And this is what they look like in May 16th, 2022. And you may think that, oh, this is just earlier in the spring, but the phenology was a little bit ahead in 2022. And, you know, kind of off to the side, you can't see there's, you know, oak leaves that are already, you know, uh, flushing and uh, yellow birch and other, other species that are, you know, norm, they look normal for that time of year in terms of phenology. And the, be the beach just were, were quite, quite bare. Um, and I will say that when there's a high level of bud abortion over the winter, a lot of times the, the, the beach will put out a second flush of foliage and that foliage is usually smaller. It's, it looks different than a normal beach leaf. Um, and it's usually a little bit yellow. So it's, it doesn't have the same amount of chlorophyll and therefore is not as, as productive, but it seems like those, that second flush of leaves is kind of a, an effort to just gain a little bit of energy to, to try to try to get through the season and get through another year. So now I'll switch over to uh, beach leaf disease management. So uh, I'm going to talk about management from a couple different perspectives and talk about some current efforts that are occurring. Um, so cultural and silvicultural uh, ma management, we're learning things all the time. Um, current thought is that if you can if you can address tree stress, uh, mitigate tree stress, your trees are going to be more resilient to beech leaf disease. It's not going to save them, but it'll kind of it'll it'll allow them to persist over a longer period of time. Uh, stressed trees are less able to sustain pressure from beech leaf disease, uh, and that's been cited in studies that beech that are growing in, on good in good locations, so they have ample water and nutrients and so forth, they're more resilient to those trees and, and seedlings and saplings that are growing on more challenging sites or are prone to drought. Um, another study found that uh, tr trees that are on steep slopes and especially on south-facing aspects uh, do better than uh, trees that are not in those situations. And that's likely related to, to moisture. So south facing slope is gonna get more sun. It's gonna be a little bit warmer probably. Therefore, there's gonna be less freestanding water for a little, less amount of time. And that's gonna reduce the potential for spread and reduce uh, survivability of, of the nematodes. So the take home here is avoiding drought stress is really important to helping tr uh, beech trees cope with, with beech leaf disease. And remember an earlier slide talking about, you know, water use efficiency being uh, significantly reduced and so metal, the stomatal conductance being much higher. These trees lose water, uh, infected trees lose water more quickly than um, uninfected uh, trees. So that's an important thing to think of if you're trying to support the health of your beech trees. Um, several years ago, uh, the, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation found a little satellite infestation of beech leaf disease, and they thought, okay, this is a great opportunity for us to try silvicultural methods to control beech leaf disease. So they spent a lot of money and created a, a very large buffer. They, they cut all the beach around that satellite inf infestation, and the next year, they found that it didn't work at all because beach, the, the, the symptoms had spread so far ahead, but the nematode had spread so far ahead and the symptoms were so light that they weren't, you know, they were very, barely detectable. So um, if that's something that you're thinking about for a year woodlot, probably not going to work. Um, better to focus on, on other, other options. But say, saying that uh, thinning beach can, uh, so, so the, the idea is that if you thin a beach stand, you're reducing competition. And you, so there's less, there's fewer trees competing for the same amount of water nutrients and so forth. And that's going to help trees be more resilient to beach leaf disease. But um, uh, it does lead to a lot of sprouts. So you have these beach thickets. And these beach thickets are where nematode populations can really build. 
in the understory. And that leads to higher rate of vertical transmission of the nematodes up into the, up into the crown. So if you are gonna thin to help your trees be more resilient, it's a good idea to also think about controlling the uh, the stump sprouts or the sorry the root the root suckers because uh, they they are going to be they're better at supporting a high nematode population. Uh, also, thinning enhances drying, and again, nematode being very dependent upon water, it's a, a, a good uh, management tactic to. Uh, to try to keep nematode populations down. Thinning also helps uh, in creating diversity, and that's really kind of a, 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 an approach to transitioning away from, let's say, a, be a you know pure beach stand into a more diverse stand that's going to be more resilient to the next thing that comes along. Uh, heaven forbid, um, but it seems like we we deal deal with new things on a pretty regular basis. Um, and having a more diverse stand of not just species, but genera on, on your property is a good way to make sure that you're gonna have trees uh, around your residence or um, in your woodlot. And remember that, uh, so some people use herbicide to thin out their beach, but you have to be really careful with that because of um, the impacts on um, so if you if you're treating a, a root sprout a root sprouted tree, you can have that, that can have some pretty serious negative impacts on on the mother tree, so to speak. So always use herbicide with extreme caution if that's a method you choose to use to uh, thin, thin your beech sprouts. So an effort that's going to be starting next year again in cooperation with the U.S. Forest Service and the New York Department of Envir Environmental Conservation. New York DEC ha must have excellent funding because they do a lot of really interesting things and um, they are going to be partnering with the U.S. Forest Service to do uh, some canopy thinning, th thinning treatments. So they're going to uh, remove all mature trees to reduce overall basal area down to about 50 to 80 uh, square feet per acre. Um, and they are going to select residual trees uh, that are less severely infected. Um, and those with the greatest vigor, so like the, the best crown ratios and so forth. And um, they're also going to be ho uh, holding trees that have beech bark disease uh, resistant characteristics. And then they're going to remove a lot of the understory, anything under five inches in diameter. And that's that's one of the treatments that they're going to be doing. Uh, they're going to be doing these treatments on pretty large er areas, so 30 acre sites. Um, so in 10 acres, they're going to do canopy thinning. In 10 acres, they're going to do understory removal. And in 10 acres, they're going to have a, a control. And they're going to do this in nine locations where they're going to be targeting uninfected areas, low sever severity areas, and high severity areas. So this is a big, a big, uh, a big trial that should uh, shed some, some good light on silvicultural techniques to try to uh, uh, help, help uh, beach resilience against uh, beach leaf disease. Uh, they're also considering a treatment where they're going to try to just straightforwardly replace the mass species with, uh, um, I think I've written here, um, chestnut. Yeah, disease res resistant chestnut. So that's another treatment that they're considering if they, if they can get the funding. So Chemical uh, BLD management is, is a possibility. Again, we're learning new things with each season and each trial. Um, phosphite chemistries show, uh, so show some good promise in helping trees cope with uh, beech leaf disease. Doesn't actually kill the nematodes, but it, trigger, it triggers a response in the tree that makes them more, uh, makes, it, makes the tree sort of, uh, in theory, less good at supporting them to the populations. So we are actually doing a trial at Viles Arboretum in Augusta using this method. And we did uh, our, our treatments, our two treatments last year, and we're planning on doing it again this, this next year and see how things go. This, I mean, we didn't think of this trial ourselves. We're just repeating something that's been done in Ohio since 2015. 
Um, they started a trial back then and they threw everything but the kitchen sink at beach leaf disease. They used all sorts of different chemicals uh, and uh, fungicides and miticides and nematicides. And in this case, this high, high potassium fertilizer and this high potassium fer fertilizer uh, has shown very good promise. And there's information about this particular treatment in, you know, in detail on the Maine Forest Service website. But anyway, you can see this, this, this is a, a picture of the tree from last year, uh, or a tree from last year that's been treated with polyphosphate since 2015. You can see it's got banding for sure, but um, it's persisted and most of the leaf tissue on this tree is good and photosynthesizing regularly and is healthy. And a tree can survive with this level of, of, uh, of damage for many, many years. So. Uh, it is, is, a, is a possibility. There's still no, so the treated trees, they still have not developed any uh, crinkling and they have normal, normal increment of growth as well. So the trees are actually growing. Those trees, however, are not infected with beech bark disease. So that's a little bit of a difference between what's going on there and what's going on in Maine. So here's a picture of me pretending to do, do the treatment on one of the trees in my yard. Um, but uh, the, the the basics are that you do two ounces of polyphosphate 30, which is a high, again, high potassium fertilizer in every 14 ounces of water. And this is based on per inch diameter. So if you have a 10 inch tree, um, you mix 20 ounces of polyphosphate with 140 ounces of water. You remove the leaf litter from the base of the tree and you gently pour, uh, pour the liquid um, onto the soil. And the idea is that the tree gets enough of this uh, potassium fertilizer to elicit that response. And you just got to be careful that you're not doing this near water. So there's a lot of runoff into, into your uh, body's water. As well. There's also some chemicals that are, are coming online that they found work really well. And this is a lot more involved than just uh, mixing up some fertilizer and some water and dumping it on the bottom of the tree. Obviously, you can see that this is a pressurized injection system. <clears throat> What this person, this person is actually injecting an elm tree with Arbitect to protect the elm tree from Dutch elm disease. Um, Arbitect has also uh, shown pro uh, promise in preserving beech trees that have low infestations of beech leaf disease and keeps uh, the levels down. And this is this has a, a two year period of effectiveness. Uh, Whereas with the polyphosphate 30 drench, you got to do it twice a year, every year to maintain that level of resistance. Uh, with this, you get uh, two years out of uh, the treatment. It involves wounding the tree at the base of the tree, um, and the chemical is very expensive. Uh, right now, this is not an option in Maine. It hasn't, uh, as far as I know, it hasn't passed the special permitting process, but it is in it is in process and I think it's gonna be available uh, to, to apply legally by, by the summer. Another fungicide, it's funny, you know, it's, a ne it's a nematode, but a fungicide is, is providing, um, is you know, reducing symptoms. So that makes me think about, you know, that extra microorganism that might be involved. But anyway, the fungicide broad form, it's a, a foliar application that's been shown to reduce ne uh, nematode numbers quite a bit. Um, I don't currently know the status of that permit. I believe it's in process as well. I, I tried the last ditch effort to get, get uh, contact with the board of pesticide control today to, to see if I could uh, get a, get the status on that. But I think that the chemical companies have an interest in getting those, those, uh, chemistries approved here in Maine for, to give us some more tools for protecting high value trees. This is not, these two things are, these two methods are not going to be something, and the, and the polyphosphate drench, for example, or in addition, those aren't going to be things that you do for every tree in your forest, but they are uh, tools to help uh, preserve high value trees. Is there an optimal timing for the polyphosphate? Yeah, so the polyphosphate is something that you, you, you apply in June and then again one month later. So you kind of give it that double dose one month apart. Are you, are you waiting for a certain point of leaf growth before you do it or just June is fine? Well, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. You, you got to watch the calendar. So it has to be based on phenology. I say the leaves have to be fully expanded because that's when you're going to get the most uptake. You're going to have transpiration happening and you're going to get the best 
distribution in the tree. So, but typically around June, again, around in July, um, that's, that's what they recommend. So biological control, I was just at a meeting in New Hampshire a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they were showing some slides that was, was amazing of this nemat um, nematophagus or nematode eating fungus that is actually persists in the gut of these nematodes. And when you pierce the gut of the nematode, this fungus comes out and uh, it, uh, <laughs> it spreads everywhere. And it creates this crazy net that traps other nematodes, and the fungus, um, the fungus uh, feeds on those nematodes. Very, very interesting. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, I don't know how they'd apply that. But other than that, there's nothing uh, very promising. But that's not to say that that something couldn't be found, and that would be great if there was a biological control for for this particular disease. But you know. Here, here in Maine or here in, in North America, we don't have that co-evolutionary history between the causal agent and the host, and therefore um, we don't have that biological control, but we'll see. Um, and again, I already, I already mentioned that, uh, I think I did, that beech trees in, in Japan were the, were the relative of the nematode that was found here. Uh, the J Japanese beech are, are impacted by uh, beech leaf disease, um, even though in theory those two co evolve. But so that, that's quite interesting. It makes me think that there might be, uh, again, a microorganism or an environmental condition that uh, causes this. So, where am I here? Again, I think I've mentioned that to, uh, several times that uh, BLD is very dependent upon water. Um, Oh, and that dead, dead nematodes have been found on branches, indicate, indicating that they migrate during wet weather. And because they can migrate and then dry out and then get wet again and wake up and migrate again, they can, they can move uh, in, in various types of weather. Uh, but, you know, research is, is gaining momentum. There's a lot more people doing a, a greater diversity of studies, and we're learning more with every month and in every year. But as with uh, tree pathology things things move a little bit more slowly. Um, I always compare it to crops. You know, annual crops are much easier to study, and the studies go much faster. And people care tend to care about them a little bit more because you can eat them. Um, even though we all know that the, the importance of trees, but uh, for for whatever reason, they tend to get a little bit less attention and a little bit less funding when it comes to studying uh, diseases and insect problems in trees. Uh, what are we doing about beech leaf disease? I often get that question, hey, what is the state doing about this? Well, we're doing pretty much everything we can. We've got nine long-term monitoring plots that we set up in 2021 and an additional in 2022, uh, funded by the US Forest Service. Um, we have two in Waldo County. Uh, one in Knox, and then others uh, spread out throughout the throughout the state. Thinking about putting some more up north, but uh, we need to find some uh, supplementary funding for that. Uh, the plots are surveyed every year, and uh, we are doing that to just just to survey and track the disease spread impacts, and uh, and, and make sure that we have the data to you know possibly contribute to. You know, telling more about the story of beech leaf disease. And this is part of a network of plots that, I um, can't remember how many, maybe there's 70 plots throughout all of New England and uh, uh, Northern New York. Uh, we also uh, collaborated on a non-structural carbohydrate study, which is a fancy way of saying we wanted to see how well the trees uh, were able to store sugars in the branches and um, in their roots uh, in the presence of uh, beech leaf disease and also compared to the control where there wasn't any uh, beech leaf disease. And this is a group of us uh, doing that, that work in Cumberland County last fall. And with that, I am open to any questions. Which includes online, so please. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so I didn't take. It. Okay. <laughs> Hang on.
Um, so you can start right here in the room. I didn't know if she was working on online questions, but well, she, yeah, go ahead. Okay, hold on, pulling it up. You talk a lot about beach stands, like forest thing. Mm -hmm. I'm here because I live a block and a half up the street. Mm -hmm. I have a massive copper beach. Okay, huge tree, mm -hmm. hundred plus years old. And my arborist tells me he thinks we got this right, and he did phosphate it last fall. Okay. Uh, and he says, we don't know, <laughs> right? basically, on big trees. He says, we have very little data on big trees. And yeah. Also, no idea if you know, this is going to work. Or, I, don't, I don't have any understory. There's nothing around it. Right. And uh, I just concerned, is there anything we should do? Does yeah. It, you know, and, and that's that's a good point, because the, the trials in, in Ohio were done on five-inch diameter trees. Yeah. And yours is considerably larger than that. So it's probably yeah. 15, 16 feet. It's actually... As a lot of beaches are, you know, it's, they must have grown shoots and then they've all grown together. Right. But the combined circumference is probably 15, 16 feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you'll see it from the ocean. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think, I mean, if that was my tree, I would be hoping for uh, the, the state to accept the, the, uh, uh, oh, the chemical application. Yes. Yeah. The injectable. The bear. Yeah, well, not not, not the, the not the broad form, form. the ar arbitrate. So arbitrate. Yeah. Yeah. but one of those injectable chemical treatments. Yeah, I think okay. that's that's probably the, the best way forward. It's you know I, they they found that to be pretty effective. It just I would look at crown health because if your crown is not healthy, if it's not full, if it's already ha has some problems associated with being very old, or if it's already has suffering from dieback from BLD, you might not get as good uptake, but it it I should think, it I should work. I think it's pretty early because I wasn't noticing yeah. any sick tree. Right, and he was there one day doing some else. Uh, I think we got a problem. Yeah, so it, it's not exactly noticeable. Yet. And also mm -hmm. from your water situation, like most of us in town, I got the driveway on one side. I got Basically, his roots are covered mostly by driveways, mm -hmm. and so I don't know how it's getting its water supply. So yeah, a tree that big though is gonna it's gonna it's it's well, found the water. Yeah, it's it's it funny water running the ground because my sump pumps are still running from the last rain. Right, sure. right, yeah. So I think I wouldn't worry too much about uh, the water situation and watering a tree of that size is would take a lot of water <laughs> to really make a difference. So I, mean, I, I think that that right. tree found, has found the water over the years and, and has a good source for it. And that's why it's so big. So on your way out, you can see it if you just walk on Street, yeah. right you, to the top of the Yeah, head. you can't miss it. Right. Oh, you, you are in the corner. I do, right? I do. <laughs> There's also a, a weeping copper beach at the corner here as you take the hard corner and start going up the hill towards uh, Lincolnville. And yeah, I, I would drive by that and I try to see it try to pay attention to the road, but I'm always, I always got one eye looking at tree diseases, <laughs> but I always try to see if, if that one's starting to show any, you know, any, any symptoms. Well, so help me, I got sick hemlocks too. So. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, that's another presentation. That is a whole other presentation, yeah. So there is um, a question, I'm going to interpret a little bit, I know, I actually know the um, person. So you talked about 2021 20, um, when it was identified, 2022, the monitoring, I think the question or sort of the follow-up is, what did it look like in 20, that area look like in 23, that when you went back to monitor, like maybe in Lincolnville or some of these other like sites um, and kind of in tandem, um, are these owners or are you as the pathologist or main forest service at large recommending removal of the trees with the monitoring or interplanting, you know, with like adaptive species, like are there, you know, how are you using these sites to, to monitor and are you kind of, making suggestions going forward yeah well, we haven't we haven't started telling people to remove trees i mean yeah, we, we don't know i mean think about what like beach bark disease how bad the trees look but they, they seem to they seem to persist and we haven't seen in maine yet we haven't on our nine long-term monitoring uh, plots we have not seen any mortality of of overstory trees of mature trees we're starting to see some mortality in the understory but we just don't know how things are going to play out in Maine. So I'm not telling people to clear cut their, you know, their, their, their beach stand just because we just, we don't know, but I am telling people to think really seriously about a, a more diverse uh, forest and, and plant not only different species, but uh, different, different, as many different genera as possible. And thinking about their ecological functions too. If you're losing a lot of mass, 
um, in, in your beach, you know, maybe you want to try something like a, like a, another nice species, like a, a black walnut or hybrid, hybrid chestnut, or, um, something something to replace what you're losing in terms of the ecological function, but also function for for yourself. If beach, uh, if there's one landowner that I've, I've worked with up in Winterport, and he had a big beach privacy screen, and now he's got beach leaf disease, and he's losing that. So I'm trying to work with him, provide him some options on, okay, so how do we transition, keep the privacy screen as as you lose yeah. some of these beach? So it's, it's I guess what I'm saying is the comp, like, it's a case-by-case -case situation. Uh, what I recommend to people, and it really depends upon landowner objectives, and um, gen tree services. Fair. Um, another question um, in terms of trying to think about management and how we as individuals with beech trees and you know woodlot owners can think about this um, is burning and uh, known like the effective uh, affected leaves. Would that be beneficial or is there any you know high heat composting? Are we getting rid of the? Are we Getting rid of nematodes that way, or are we by burning you? Yeah, you are. Yeah. You are by burning. Com composting. I don't know yes. what their heat tolerances like. are, but they they're just very robust creatures. So you know, bur burning uh, burning leaves definitely at the right time of year, of course. To... Okay. So like even in the case of our our friend with this really large, I mean, it's a specimen tree by all if I ever measure. So if he cleared, if he knows or is suspected that that he's got it raking up and burning those leaves in the fall might be help they, they to decrease over the composting. Oh, somebody nice that does it over by was it corner, side of the corner, yeah, the farm nice. up there. He lets mm -hmm. you drop off all everyone's done all kinds of leaves and that's the but massive but compost spread. Up there. Yeah, that, that's that's a again, that's an unknown. We don't know if it's it's gonna spread and compost. I, I think once you start the composting process, the moisture and a lot of the other microorganisms that are that are you know in, in that compost are going to yeah, like a crock pot. Yeah, it's kind of like a crock pot, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of pathogens, for example, tree pathogens, they they don't do well competing with um, decomposition organisms, things that are really good at de deteriorating dead stuff. Um, they they take over and they just smother everything else but i say that but i you know i don't know how that translates it with the nematode eggs and if you were to transport that compost to someplace and you put it in your garden you know for your tomatoes or something like that if those beach you know if there's going to be some eggs that hatch and that, that the nematodes are going to be able to find a, a beach tree are pretty unlikely but it really depends upon how it's being used So I work for Post Mountain Land Trust and mm -hmm. we manage lots. We own 7,500 acres mm -hmm. and we have it Everywhere. throughout all, mm -hmm. most, if not all, of our preserves. Mm -hmm. And we're asked by land trust, by community members and land trust members, like, what can we do? Mm -hmm. And what what are you all doing? And we've kind of just been like, we're learning more. Yeah. But like, is there anything that we should be leaning towards or pointing people in the right direction or is there any other kind of conversation that's worth having other than like this is what like just wait and see you know it's yeah i'll, I'll again say you know promoting promoting diversity um and replacing ecological function uh and you, like you said you know, like like and like i've said we just don't know and it, it's it stinks to wait this uh, civil cultural uh, study that the Forest Service is doing is, is you know, great. Is potentially going to answer some really great questions, but we're going to be waiting, you know, five, six more years before we have results from that. So, for as rampant as it's been here on the mid coast, like I think seeing your slide about the southern facing slopes, like that's mostly where our beach is growing. Like if you look at our north, like the Camden Hills, the mm -hmm. northern side is mm -hmm. mostly conifers or yeah. hemlock or mm -hmm. just by the way that they're geographically shaped. Yeah. And so I think seeing your slide of like it's less likely on some yeah. sleeps still slopes. So it's not to question that. Right. But like we certainly have a hot spot for it. Mm -hmm. I think I think the coast, I mean maybe that statement by me is is less 
applicable to the coastal environment where yeah. you have more fossil I wasn't challenged with that. Yeah, no. It's just... I mean, it, I, yeah, it, it, it's kind of site dependent and it's hard to make generalizations about something you just don't yeah. know that much about. Yeah. So, you know, we have, we have about four stands of beach at Mary Spring mm -hmm. uh, in Montana, and they're on the southern slope. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they have everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the last thing, like, not the last thing, but like one of the things, <clears throat> you know, land trust, we're going to tell people we don't bunch, you know, high spots, we, yeah, right. whatever on yep. the ground. But, yeah. I mean, it is a management tool and it is a resource to say an assessment tree and you're doing something with intent, mm -hmm. but it comes down to management and like best practices and who's doing it, whether it's a license applicator. Yeah. yeah. It's not just. And it's not a phosphate, it's a phosphite. Yeah. And there's there's a real clear distinction. Right. And I think a lot of people are going to misinterpret or just right. run and grab said fertilizer. And is it just it's not the right application? A fast fight or is it like. Is there three numbers like most fertilizers, like zero zero thirty? It's or zero zero thirty three yeah. or something. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, and the that's the so polyphosphate thirty is a, a brand name of a, of a material that can be can be bought by an applicator. Yep. It, it's kind of complicated to get get the stuff. It's mostly used on golf courses as mm -hmm. a grass fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and the company. Uh, 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 as far as I know, only sells to people who won't sell those private citizens. Yep. Yep. So, uh, and, and again, in, in your situation, it's not probably something that's going to be used. It may be so that you know you might want to do some thinning and just see maybe some understory control, maybe you know to mirror maybe some of the things that are being done by New York DEC and U.S. Forest Service and uh, demonstration areas. I mean. We can be part of figuring out the solution too. We don't have to do the statistics and the yeah. and, and uh, the highly high, high scientific stuff, but uh, we can see what we can see what works. Well, I want to thank everybody. Um, be mindful of everyone's time, especially Aaron's, and uh, we appreciate it. This will be um, this has been recorded and will be um, appropriately edited to just make sure, you know, we can get it back up and, uh, it won't be immediate. So bear with us. It might be a week or two or so to get it re rebroadcast, but, um, we will have this available so you can go back and highlight those areas that you didn't quite catch. Um, we want to share with friends. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in everybody. And, uh, best of luck in this.